I am the Director of Education for the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey, which is providing today's program. Our webinar today is titled Strategies to Promote, Protect, and Support Equitable Breastfeeding in the Black Community, and is the first of many events this week for Black Maternal Health Week. So just a few pieces of informa information before we get started. An hour after the webinar ends, you will receive an email with a link to a post-program evaluation. Please complete the survey to provide us with feedback on the program. To receive a certificate of completion, you must listen to the entire webinar and complete the evaluation survey. Certificates of completion will be sent via email approximately one week after the webinar broadcast. This program is being recorded and will be available on the Partnerships YouTube channel. We will be muting all attendees' microphones during the presentation, but we would love to hear from you. Please write questions in the question box and the speakers will respond to as many as possible at the conclusion of the presentation. Now I would like to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Nastasha Davis is a registered nurse, international board certified lactation consultant, a mother of four and resident of New Jersey. She has over 16 years of experience working with birthing families. Dr. Davis is passionate about improving access to qualified lactation professionals and improving breastfeeding rates in the black community. She's the owner of Latch Breastfeeding and Lactation Services and founder of the Perinatal Health Equity Foundation a nonprofit advocacy and support organization dedicated to eliminating racial disparities in Black infant and maternal health. In addition to her public health commitments, Dr. Davis serves, serves as assistant professor of nursing at Montclair State University. Dr. Davis's research and clinical interests include implicit bias and racism in healthcare, breastfeeding in the Black community, obstetrical violence, high-risk OB, and reproductive justice. We also welcome Melanie Hutton. Melanie is a certified lactation counselor and birth doula with over eight years of experience in maternity units, intervention programs, and healthcare centers. Melanie currently works with Sisters Who Breastfeed Jersey City and Patterson, a parenting group with a partnership for maternal and child health in collaboration with the Perinatal Health Equity Foundation. The group focuses on healthy practices for feeding babies and is made up of pregnancy and postpartum women who identify as Black and live in Jersey City or Patterson. We first welcome Dr. Davis. Hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to join you um, on the second day of Black Maternal Health Week and present my um, original research to you um, of a study I did actually for my doctoral um, degree on uh, barriers to exclusive breastfeeding in Black women. Okay, so disclosure statement, um, you can read here. I have nothing personally to disclose and no financial interest to disclose. What can you expect from this talk? Um, there's gonna be some uncomfortable conversations, uh, but that's where growth happens. It's a presentation of my research displaying the lived experiences of black women in New Jersey. Um, I hope there is some room for self-reflection as well as some actionable steps that you can take for change today. So the reason behind the research. My research project stemmed out of uh, really the basic question as to are we asking the right question about Black women? The question is always why Black women or why are Black women not breastfeeding? When we should be asking, how are we failing those that try? So for those of you that are not new to the breastfeeding, chest feeding world, um, we know that there are a significant amount of benefits to uh, receiving human milk. Um, you will hear me shift my language um, to include uh, more inclusive terms, breastfeeding and chest feeding. Um, if I use one, it's not to admit the other, um, but just making that statement at the beginning. So we know that exclusive um, breastfeeding or chest feeding is recommended for the first six months of life. Um, and that as a country, we have failed consistently um, to reach uh, both the 2010 and now the 2020 benchmarks for breastfeeding. Um, we're making progress, but we still have some work to do. Um, and then as far as um, breastfeeding rates in the Black community, uh, they still re trail behind all of our racial counterparts. Okay. So human milk is significantly important to Black infants. 
when we look at our infant mortality rate in the state of New Jersey, it's 4.8 deaths per 1,000 live births as a whole. But for Black babies specifically, 9.7 out of every 1,000 births will never celebrate their first birthday. So New Jersey has a lot of work to do in this particular area. So I want to talk briefly about the Healthy Women's Healthy Family Grant uh, that Melanie's work is centered around. There are nine or eight cities in New Jersey that um, have very high Black infant mortality rates. They are Newark, Irvington, East Orange, Patterson, Jersey City, Atlantic City, Camden, and Trenton. Okay, so as a state, we are ranked fifth in the nation of overall infant mortality. So in that respect, as a state, we're not doing bad. But when you drill down to the racial gaps and the disparities, um, we have a significant rate there. And so what does all of that have to do with breastfeeding? If you look at the CDC's top reason for infant deaths, you'll see preterm birth and low birth weight as part of that as well as sudden infant death syndrome. And these are the areas where we believe breastfeeding can make an impact for black infants. And we know that human milk has the power to save lives. So a quick lit review, uh, black women are 60% more likely to deliver a preterm baby than white women. We have lower initiation rates and continuation rates of black women. And we are also more likely to be introduced to formula in the hospital. In our work, we, uh, we had to define what African-American meant. Um, the literature really had various different terms. Um, we chose to use the term, um, meaning that you had, uh, you were descendant of slaves essentially in order to qualify under that, under that category. Um, having social influence of wet nursing, which can be traced back to slavery. Um, and then also some cultural influence that we looked at um, was the uh, sexualization of the black body. So a little bit about slavery's influence. This is a quick quote um, that talks about the lived experience of a slave who was wet nursing. And she says, I wish I dried up. I wish every drop of my milk slipped past those pink lips and nourished the ground where the bones lay of my babies starved while I fed their murderer. I wish I dried up so that the Mrs. Baby would dry up too and be brittle so I could crumble them to dust, return them to ground, where all children of my bosom lay equal. So this quote is very powerful to me in that it speaks to the trauma associated with breastfeeding and how breastfeeding wasn't a choice and autonomy was taken away and how that continues to have an influence. And so in that respect, um, many black women chose not to breastfeed as time went on as an act of resistance for not previously having that bodily autonomy. What I wanna point out for our state specifically, and this data is supported with our um, MPINC scores, hospitals that serve black women um, or are located in black uh, communities um, are more likely to be offered formula. And if you look statistically at our exclusive breastfeeding rate in those hospitals, um, you can see that data reflected. Another influence was targeted formula marketing. This is an image of the Fault Squad um, and if you're not familiar with them, they were the one of the first surviving sets of black quadruplets, um, and they became the poster child for what was called pet milk, um, it, which is uh, where the infant formula um, kind of became rooted from. And each of these uh, women died of breast cancer at various stages in their life, different ages, but each one of them succumbed to breastfeeding or, or to breast cancer. So our problem statement was really looking at, there are not a lot of baby-friendly hospitals that are centered in African-American communities. Um, the maternity practices in uh, facilities that are in African-American communities tend to be less supportive of breastfeeding. There's less emotional support. There's a negative social perception of breastfeeding. And then there was an absence of culturally competent support. And so just a little backstory on why I did this study, uh, really centered around what I was seeing in my own private practice, where I was seeing many, many women, uh, Black women who wanted to breastfeed, but the system failed their success. And so they are coming because they had no other resource um, and were really looking to get some support to be able to continue their journey. So our question was, 
Um, why are New Jersey African American women who desire exclusive breastfeeding unable to achieve exclusivity during their fourth trimester? And our method is that we did basically a case study review. Recruitment was done through social media. We had our inclusion criteria, and it's a very small study, about seven participants, um, but we're all um, located in Essex County, New Jersey. So this was our inclusion criteria. They had to self-identify as African-American, live in New Jersey, um, plan to be exclusive, but had to give formula for some reason, uh, delivered between 2016 and 2019, and were between the ages of 20 and 44. Um, it was important demographically that they had different income ranges. I think when we look at disparities, we tend to only associate them with lower income. Uh, and the data tells us that, that is not true. Um, black women who are actually higher earners and higher educated are actually more likely to succumb to these disparities. And our results are here. So from the participants, most of them were first generation breastfeeders. Um, Formula was their primary point of reference, meaning that they did not have um, other family members who um, were breastfeeding. They became advocates for human milk through their journey. Uh, they resented the lack of inclusion of the father in their breastfeeding journey. There was a strong desire for Black lactation professionals. Uh, they wished for visibility of Black breastfeeding and looked for support and were unable to find it. Some um, background that went into their decision to breastfeed was basically it was made earlier their pregnancy which the research supports um, they wanted to ward off future disease so one mother specifically um, expressed having um, diabetes and, and wanting to prevent that for her child um, they felt that there were medicinal properties in breast milk and that human milk was in fact for human babies uh, i'm using the term mama and mother because that is how all of our participants um, I self-identified as. Um, six out of seven of them felt like they reached their breastfeeding goals despite introducing formula. So I want to just quickly go through some of the, theme, the themes that came from our analysis. Um, most notably was the health provider's role in formula use. Uh, so lack of support or withholding information, um, fake offers to help, which I will describe shortly, and then primary C-sections having a significant impact on their ability to be successful, a lack of knowledge, implicit bias and racism in their breastfeeding journey. So in theme one, um, there was six out of seven who were encouraged to give formula by their provider. Um, most were um, for infant weight loss, hypoglycemia, or for the encouragement to rest. Some th sub themes that emerged was uh, the lack of support or withholding information. So basically providers providing inaccurate information. Um, so there was a lot of fact checking on the, on the behalf of the participants to really find out what exactly they should be doing. Um, fake help, and this really came from inside the hospital of offering discharge support, but then when they followed up to receive it, it was not available. Um, primary C-sections. We know New Jersey as a state has a very high uh, primary C-section rate, um, but more specifically when we look at Black women, their rates of C-sections are higher as well. So that created some separation um, and lack of being able to observe that um, golden hour of skin to skin and also an um, instability of participants due to pain management issues. Um, I want to just read one quote. Um, when I went to this one hospital, they were more orthodox, I want to say, where breastfeeding was the only thing that you could do. Again, not getting information about pumping. It was just as if your body is rejecting him from, um, from, rejecting him from the breast then, so then there's no options, but pumping was never one of them. And this is a statement about a hospital, IBCLC. I don't think that she was helpful. That's the type of information I was getting which clearly didn't help because it didn't do me well with my son. If anything, she should, have, she should have been telling me, you need to pump this amount or you should only have to feed your son this much per hour um, if you're away. She didn't give me what I needed. So my takeaway was that to make sure that whoever I'm getting counsel from or even telling other people, whoever they're getting counsel from, informal lactation support, that they are well certified and that they do know the most current up-to-date information on this. 
Um, an example was on fake help, which basically meant that they were offered support at discharge. And then when they called to get that discharge support, it wasn't available. So they basically had them continue to search for support on their own. There was no direct support provided. Fear mongering was another one that came up quickly, um, which basically put the guilt on the parent that their breast milk was not good enough to be able to um, support uh, weight gain or support reversal of hypoglycemia. They were not offered the option to breastfeed to correct any of those issues. Latch wasn't assessed. Um, and so they basically made them feel like their milk wasn't good enough. And if they did not provide formula to their baby, that there was gonna be a very bad outcome. So they felt forced. Um, another was just not knowing what they didn't know. So not having taken a breastfeeding class, um, those that did attend breastfeeding classes said that the education was not effective. They did not, um, they weren't able to recall that information um, or utilize it during their breastfeeding journey. Uh, just being unfamiliar with breastfeeding norms, specifically with cluster feeding and growth spurts. Uh, they did not have any self-confidence, so decreased self-efficacy. Um, and then they also used Facebook um, and other online resources to help them in their journey. Um, this is just one mom describing what her experience is about cluster feeding, um, basically just not understanding that the cluster feeding wasn't a lack of milk, um, but just a normal process of breastfeeding. So implicit bias in black breastfeeding, assumptions of formula feeding by providers, um, feeding infant without consent um, or permission, so feeding infant formula in the hospital without consent, permission, or knowledge, negative comments about Black bodies, and then lack of access to Black providers. So the Kawan Institute defines implicit bias as the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. These biases, which encompass both favorable and unfavorable assessments, are activated involuntarily and without an individual's awareness or intention. But I do wanna point out that impact is still there. And so if damage is caused, we need to take ownership of that regardless of whether there was intent to do harm or not. So um, assumptions about formula. Um, the health benefits are unexplained. It's not really pushed for black women or Latino women to breastfeed. Even in the hospital, when I wanted to breastfeed my son, they immediately gave me the formula of choice for him. I was like, no, even though I had him at ABC Hospital, which happened to be a baby-friendly facility. I'm not going to say that, but it was just offered immediately. Here's his formula. He has to be fed this amount, this amount of times before I was even asked, are you breastfeeding? Are you interested? It was more of a, here's the formula. And I'm like, no, I'm breastfeeding. It was that type of thing. I do think that it should be introduced more to women of color because they push you away from it before you even learn about it. So some mis misinformation from providers. No, they just, just, no, because when I asked why he was crying and why he was staying up, they told me he was hungry. That's what drove me to formula. Not at all. Honestly, it was very brief. It was just more of, do you know if he's full? Is his weight gain okay? How is he sleeping through the night? It wasn't really any suggestions or tips or even encouragement to keep going. It was just more so of making sure that this and making sure that, make sure that he feels okay, make sure that he's full. Not more so of the great, keep going, do this, try that. It wasn't that. And this was an experience um, from one of our participants on their experience in the hospital. Uh, I'll read one example from here from a participant. After one week, I had, um, I guess, had two doctor's visits. And at the end of the first week, they said she wasn't gaining weight and they gave us two bottles of formula to take home with me. And I cried in the doctor's office, like, you're not going to take this from me. So implicit bias when it comes to the black body. I don't wanna say race played a role, but I'm going to say this. When it comes to nipple size too, it seemed like she was taken aback by the areola being bigger and the nipple. I'm not a professional to know what different race nipples look like, but she made a, this statement like, African-American women's areolas are bigger than most. How to hold it instead of pinching it, like cupping it type of thing. I'm hoping it wasn't a race thing, but I think it was a race thing as well. 
So this just goes on to um, describe um, a, a pediatric visit where their first question was, what type of formula is the baby drinking instead of asking about breastfeeding? So again, just working on those assumptions um, that Black women are not going to breastfeed. And so summary of our findings really was that um, this research fills a gap focusing on exclusive breastfeeding. Most research that we will find focus on, focuses on why Black women are not breastfeeding, but we kind of uh, leave out the women who really do want to breastfeed and aren't successful in their journey. Um, success in breastfeeding over barriers is linked to decision making. So a strong will and desire to breastfeed spurred perseverance. Early introduction of formula use did not significantly disrupt breastfeeding duration in this particular population. Breastfeeding education is deficient and implicit and, and explicit bias and racism showed up in all of our themes. So those that are designed to help support breastfeeding were ultimately the ones responsible for undoing it, either consciously or subconsciously. Desired support was not received. I suggest not offering support if you can't give it. Um, find resources to point families to if you're not able to offer that support yourself. Those called to promote support and protect breastfeeding shouldn't be the ones undermining it. Peer support is powerful and is grossly underused and a cultural approach is needed. So how do we change this narrative? If you're not familiar with cultural humility, it is the um, newer, more accepted term over cultural competence. Um, cultural humility is a continuum of education. It requires constant self-reflection. It acknowledges that there is a power imbalance between the provider and the patient. It centers that the patient is the expert on their health, although we as providers come to the table with clinical excellence um, and expertise and its ability to recognize and let go of stereotypes. And also acknowledgement that being of a particular race doesn't make you the expert, expert on the care of people in that race. So this is a quote from Dr. Jan Murray Garcia, um, an isolated increase in knowledge without a consequence change in attitude and behavior is of questionable value. In face, in facing existing literature documentation, a lack of cultural competence in clinical practice most reflects not a lack of knowledge, but rather the need to change, need for a change in practitioner's self-awareness and a change in their attitudes towards diverse patients. So in looking at competence, we tend to feel we can achieve expertise and it is impossible to achieve expertise in a culture that is not your own. We as an organization believe in equity in breastfeeding, not equality. Uh, equity means providing resources to those who are in need, um, not distributing resources equally to everyone. Other known barriers, um, lack of access to lactation professionals that are reflective of the community, early return to work, having high risk pregnancies and preterm births, higher rates of C-sections, and then lack of family and community support. And so how can we drive change? Healthcare providers need implicit bias and anti-racism training. It is not enough to not be racist, but we must also be anti-racist. And so that means education is continuing on a continuum. A one-time training is not sufficient. Shifting to use cultural humility over cultural competency. Understanding that breastfeeding isn't one size fits all. So looking at breastfeeding, chest feeding, exclusively pumping as alternatives. There are many families who pump and exclusively do so and are successful. Sharing all the options. So many participants reported that their, the option for exclusive breastfeeding or exclusive pumping, for example, was not discussed with them. And so they felt like breastfeeding was all or nothing. And then also to tell the truth about breastfeeding. There is this, um, image that because breastfeeding is natural that it is therefore easy and breastfeeding is hard and we need to really acknowledge that in the beginning it is very difficult um, but there are support and resources to help families get through those difficult times um, and help them to develop the self-efficacy to get through those challenges. I want to make a statement that black women are the experts on their bodies so although again as we come to the table with our clinical knowledge and clinical expertise we are not experts on our individual patients and their health. 
the patient is the expert in that scenario. Some action steps that we can take. Uh, we've got to stop telling parents that they don't have milk. Colostrum is milk, um, and we need to acknowledge that and encourage that language. Increase in baby-friendly hospitals and communities of color. And I say this loosely um, only because it has been found in the literature that baby-friendly hospitals um, do not protect Black women, um, that Black women experience in the same issues that they would in any other hospital in baby-friendly hospitals as well. So we need to work on not just implementing a baby-friendly hospital uh, guidelines, but also changing our practices that are reflective of um, anti-racist and structural racism behaviors. Uh, more support for women of color in breastfeeding, equity over equality. Integrate content um, into, the healthcare, um, into the healthcare system on disparities. Uh, know your community and connect them with support. A number one complaint was that because many women traveled to various hospitals to have better birth out, um, outcomes, that the resources that they were given, they weren't useful to them because they were not in their own community. And then I would also encourage post-class evaluations. Sometimes the information that we're giving, we may feel as the educator is useful, but the patient is not receiving that information as useful. So it is a good idea to do post-class post evaluations to really gauge um, what the families felt was a deficit in their breastfeeding journey that could be improved upon. Uh, avoid making assumptions. That was a recurrent theme in this study. Um, just making sure that we understand that um, Black women do, in fact, breastfeed, and we should be asking in all circumstances open-ended questions about feeding options. Um, ask questions and listen. Um, forget what you think you know about breastfeeding. That really comes from interrupting the script, which is from Jan Marie Garcia's work um, on cultural humility and implicit bias, which really just speaks to making sure that we understand um, where, that there are stereotypes that exist um, and that we are doing the work to undo um, bringing those stereotypes to the table um, in our interactions with our families. Consistency in messaging regarding breastfeeding, and I know this is a universal theme really among everyone that is breastfeeding, that we get one message from um, the lactation consultant, one message from the nurse, one message from the pediatrician, and they're not the same. And so getting on the same page with us all taking um, really the evidence-based information that's out there and streamlining it and, and looking for it. If we don't know the answer that we're, we're referring families out to someone who does know the answer, opposed to making up things. Um, the understanding that one-time trainings just aren't enough, that this education has to continue on a continuum. Um, the other thing is the importance of creating safe zones and areas that are judgment-free for our patients. Many of the participants in the study felt that they were being judged um, and they didn't feel safe in their environments. Now, this one I know is a controversial issue, but we must have real conversations about safe sleep. There are ways to safely co-sleep, and we cannot make the assumption that because there's a risk for SIDS, um, that this should not be part of the conversation. Um, we know what the risk factors are that are associated with SIDS. Uh, we know that breastfeeding is and chest feeding is one of the mechanisms that can reduce the rates of sudden infant death syndrome, but we need to provide um, safe, um, real conversations about how to safely co-sleep. And this is one example that was given from La Leche League. Um, there are many other examples out there. Um, McKenna has a lot of work on safe sleep as well, um, but we need to have very real and honest conversations about being able to do this because it is such a important component of successful breastfeeding and the literature supports that. So we know that families are doing it anyway. And so um, if we're not asking the question, they're, they're, because they know many families reported that they just hide this information from their provider because they know that they'll be shamed for it, so they don't talk about it. Um, but in not talking about it, what we risk is that families are implementing unsafe practices in their home. Um, and so as a result, um, we're going to have incidences of um, preventable deaths. So we, we do need to start having that conversation. It's the same as the abstinence conversation. Um, not talking about sex does not stop people from engaging in it. Um, what we can do is provide them with the tools to do it safely. Um, and so safe sleep uh, falls in that same guidelines. 
Pumping is often a necessary component of breastfeeding. As I mentioned, um, exclusive breastfeeding or exclusive pumping um, is a choice that many families make, but unfortunately they're not given the tools to be able to successfully do that. It's often perceived as a choice that is going to be more difficult for them to be successful in. Um, when families ask for pumps in the hospital, they're not provided. So I think we need to do more um, digging instead of just um, declining to give people a pump, understand what their goals and their resources are. And if someone is struggling with breastfeeding, um, obviously refer them to someone that can support them, but we also need to give all of the choices and all of the options and exclusive pumping is one of them. Um, Nichelle Clark does an amazing presentation on exclusive pumping. She is a um, newly certified IBCLC who has been a champion in talking about exclusive pumping and successfully did so for, I think she's coming up on 18 or 24 months or something like that now. Um, so it is an option for families and should not be omitted from the conversation. And so with that, I will hand the mic over to Melanie. Um, thank you. And um, I just wanna say, first off, um, I'm very happy to be here and be able to share this information and participate in uh, the celebration and just getting information out there about how important it is to help facilitate and prepare our Black women to breastfeed successfully. So my name is Melanie Hutton. I am a certified lactation counselor and I've been working with the perinatal population of Northern New Jersey for over eight years. Um, I joined the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey in 2018. And in my current role, I facilitate a breastfeeding support group specifically geared toward Black pregnant and postpartum breastfeeding families. Uh, next slide. Um, in New Jersey, well, in 2014, New Jersey passed uh, hospital regulations that required the implementation of 10 steps to successful breastfeeding. There are 13 hospitals that have been recognized as baby friendly, and this plan is used to help encourage helpful and tangible actions to encourage breastfeeding success. Now, um, one of the tools that we use as lactation professionals is a library of handouts and links to offer, like Dr. Davis had mentioned earlier, but some additional steps should be taken. Um, and to kind of repeat and bring home the importance of conversations on what the moms specifically need and take a step back and understand that there are there are cultural and personal differences that can impact the path of the breastfeeding family. So connections to appropriate resources will increase the chances of breastfeeding success. Next slide. There are many uh, online resources available to Black breastfeeding mothers, uh, like Sisters Who Breastfeed, which is local to New Jersey and is uh, the group that I facilitate for the Northern side, Pat fo which focuses on Patterson and Jersey City. But there's farther reaching groups like Chocolate Milk Cafe and Black Breastfeeding Mom Circle, which all have, which are all accessible online. Um, our grant, as Dr. Davis mentioned, focuses on gaining equity in breastfeeding support for Black birth givers in Patterson and Jersey City. Um, next slide. So breastfeeding support is needed for Black women because we have the worst breastfeeding outcomes and highest mortality rates. And peer-to-peer -peer models work and studies have shown that it has a positive impact on breastfeeding outcomes. Next slide. So these are not segregated groups. These are safe spaces to share lived experiences and talk about cult cultural practices without judgment. These are uh, places where women can feel free and birth givers can feel free to share uh, the, the comments that family members make that may be specific to a certain culture and feel comfortable in doing so because someone else may be able to relate and not find it so foreign and we can address it 
and 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 dissect it and move on from it and again in a safe space so um as this slide points out our group is specifically formulated to create equity by focusing on those who really need it um, and the peer-to-peer -peer models do work we have sh shown success in the group and the women move on to meet their goals and exceed their goals next slide so High black inf infant mortality rates have been identified in targeted cities, again, such as Patterson and Jersey City. And our breastfeeding model utilizes tools to reduce black breast black mortality rate out black mortality outcomes by by offering information on how to gain exclusive breastfeeding. Um, we have an IBCLC support, which is Dr. Davis, and all the group leaders have gone through a minimum of 45 hours of breastfeeding education, which can lead our group facilitators and almost um, the almost any of the moms interested in becoming a lactation professional. They can find ways to reach out because our 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 sisters who breastfeed is a pathway to sitting for the IBCLC exam. Um, next slide. So we welcome black birthing people from teenage teenagers and up, uh, pregnant and postpartum, and again, women who are residents of Patterson and Jersey City. Um, currently, we are supporting families in virtual spaces. Um, we do offer support and constant connections through a closed Facebook community, and we do aim to return to in-person contact when it's safely possible. Next slide. So we have enrolled over 100 Black mothers and conducted focus groups, celebrated community baby showers. Uh, we've integrated the Centering Pregnancy Group prenatal care model and an ambassador program that launched this year in 2021. Our families have reported increased duration longevity and confidence in breastfeeding since becoming members and most report exceeding their breastfeeding their personal breastfeeding goals next slide and again this these are some of some snapshots of how we meet which is uh this is a snapshot of our books and babies meeting where our moms and our babies come together for a virtual story time and we hold this event every week and it's it's a great way to facilitate some bonding activities and encourage the moms to do these activities on their own and this group has actually um given a little uh we call it um gentle competition because our moms in the group have uh started to build their own home libraries and read to their babies and they share images and suggestions for books for us to read based on this activity we do together which doesn't necessarily relate to breastfeeding but it does relate to bonding and it's an awesome um extension of what our group has to offer um, next slide. I want to just jump in quickly, Melanie, because you brought up such a good point. Um, our groups have sometimes taken over a life of their own. And that's what I love so much about this space is that the mothers become so engaged in the work that they come up with things that we couldn't even have thought of on our own. And so that really helps to build not only um, a sense of community, but a sisterhood between these mothers. Um, they have gone on to create friendships outside of our groups. Yes. Um, they do things with their babies together. Um, and so having that support, um, not only, you know, as a breastfeeding support, but through the journey of motherhood is really what we have set out to accomplish. So yes, we're rooted in trying to address breastfeeding disparities, but because most of these women are first generation breastfeeders, they're the only one in their family to have that journey having someone else that you can rely on to share that information with is really, really important. 
Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for adding that in. <laughs> so, like I said before, um, our program has shown success. Um, we have over 100 local Black mothers enrolled. Um, again, we've hosted community baby showers with um, full attendance. Registration and attendance is always, um, ex they meet each other exactly, so the women show up. Um, centering pregnancy has become a wonderful uh, resource for recruitment and outreach. And again, um, there's increased duration, increased longevity. Um, there's women in the group that I speak to uh, individually and in the group that thought when they were pregnant that they would not be able to breastfeed, even with the information that they had, and then staying with the group, attending our group meetings, um, checking in with me via text, phone calls, um, things like that, they report have given them the ability to continue through and, and bounce back from the hurdles that happen while you're breastfeeding. The cluster feedings, as Dr. Davis mentioned, um, the comments that the physicians make, um, we, dis we again dissect and discuss those in the groups and, and we explain them so that the moms can understand it and, and feel normal and make no breastfeeding normal for them. Next slide. And I, I want to just expand yes. on that, Mel, um, mm -hmm. because our group is, is free. Um, and that's part of one of the biggest barriers with breastfeeding success. And I think we all know that there's, there's WIC available, um, but not all mothers qualify for WIC. So if you are in that kind of gray area of not having um, the ability to pay, but also don't meet the income requirements to qualify for WIC, you really don't have any lactation resources to call on. And Melanie has been such an amazing component of this group because she is available to these moms when, when they need her. They have her cell phone number, they can text her. You know, obviously she's not available you know, all, all hours of the night, but she's able to give them an individualized approach um, because that's, that's her job, that's what her position is for. And so having someone that is dedicated specifically to working on these issues um, really, really has helped improve our breastfeeding rates in these two communities. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so this is um, basically what Dr. Davis was just saying a moment ago, a way to reach us. So I am available by phone by text, by email. Um, I'm accessible to our members through our Facebook group, through Messenger, um, just almost any mode uh, through word of mouth in the community. I've had moms tell me that they're going to share my telephone number and that's okay also. Um, hospitals reach out and ask if I can support a mom. The partnership for Maternal and Child's Health, our programs, um, kind of overlap and I may have a uh, NFP nurse, nurse family partnership or an early childhood education uh, worker reach out and ask for some support. So any of these methods of contact are awesome and I would love to connect with more women in the community and again, increase our breastfeeding rates for black women and decrease our black maternal and infant mortality rates. Yes, and Melanie is specific to Jersey City um, in Patterson, um, mm -hmm. but our group is a standalone um, model from the Perinatal Health Equity Foundation. Um, and so right now we have branches in um, the Oranges in Newark. Uh, we also have a chapter down in South Jersey that's run by um, Tanisha and uh, Veronica. So I have, I did not put their contact information up here, but I can share that as well. Um, and it's a model that's available to be implemented. So if you are interested in starting a group in your um, community, that's something that can be discussed as well. Um, but it's um, it's a model that's out there and is available. I think thank that you. might be our last slide. I think it is, and thank yeah. you. <laughs> All right, thank so you I so much. Just... Go, ahead. Go ahead, sorry. Sure, you can, do you have more to say? Oh, no, I just wanted to add, um, because Melanie did touch on um, us being a Pathway One program, um, and I just want to just highlight how important that is for people being able to get into the field. Um, as I mentioned from the research, there is a significant gap 
um, in black IBCLCs in our state. Um, I think I can think of maybe 10 or so um, that I know of, um, but I wanna encourage everyone to think about um, the requirements for hospital entry for IBCLCs. Um, many of the families and women that I work with who are interested in becoming IBCLCs do not have a nursing background. And many of our hospitals require you to be an RN in order to achieve um, a hospital role, which means that we're, we're vying for more IBCLCs to be in the community um, and have jobs, but not necessarily creating um, an equitable pathway for them to have accessible employment. So I encourage everyone to think about that as um, a significant barrier to entry to practice um, to be able to work as an IBCLC. Um, you can be an amazing IBCLC and not be a registered nurse. And I, I do want to highlight that um, as a nurse myself. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis and Melanie. We appreciate all of this. Um, we do have some time for some questions and we have a couple so far. Um, one qu first question is, can you describe more the fake support? Was the support really not there when it was offered and shouldn't have been offered or was she just denied it when she needed it? So it was a combination of both of those things. Um, the examples that I've been given um, were that they were told if you have any trouble when you go home, you can call here and we'll help you. And so then when she had trouble and she called, um, she was told that support didn't exist and there was no one available to help them. Um, so it's more um, just kind of almost like pacifying them in the moment to try to get them through that experience, but then not really providing any viable resources that they can follow up on and actually utilize. Okay, thank you. Um, another one is, do you have recommendations for when I'm helping a black mother to breastfeed and her mother or her grandmother are discouraging it? How should I address it with the older generation? Um, I don't know that you want to have that conversation addressing it with them. It may be better for you to have the conversation with the parent and empower them to be able to have that conversation. Um, that's going to get you into a power struggle and dynamic that you probably don't want to be involved in. Um, so you can always, you know, it's the patient's right to have privacy. You can always ask them to leave the room if you're in the middle of working with a patient. They don't need to be there for that. Um, but that's kind of where our groups are so useful is that we've definitely had conversations with family members, talked about strategies to um, empower moms to have those conversations with their family members. Um, and sometimes that means that they end up, you know, hiding their breastfeeding experience because some family members make it so unbearable um, for them to continue. So we can always provide education and resources, um, but ultimately sometimes I'll invite them to a class. Like if I'm teaching on breastfeeding, I'll say, bring, bring grandma with you to this class so that it's not necessarily the, the mother that has to have that really difficult conversation, but they can hear it coming from a professional in. Um, the generation behind us really is giving the information that they know, what they were taught, what was passed down. And it's not necessarily meant to be damaging, but this is the damage and the trauma that was left behind from breastfeeding in the past. Um, and so they bring some of those experiences to the table with them. So it's not that they are necessarily not supportive. It's that they don't have the knowledge and the information. And so if we can help to share that, we can help to undo some of those barriers. Great, thank you. Um, another question is, I run a breastfeeding support group. Uh, what recommendations do you have for when I'm working with a black with a black patient to let her know that she is welcome to come to my group, but also let her know about other breastfeeding support groups for black women? Um, do you have anything to add, Mel? Um, that's that's actually a really good um, question. I like that one. Um, I think the easiest way to tackle that or to address it would be to make the offer um, and just let them know that, let that mom know that there is extra support. You know, there's extra support. There may be a group that is closer to home. There may be a group that does activities that interest you. Um, the, the group facilitator could learn about that black breastfeeding group or our breast, black breastfeeding group to give specifics. I, I see that you have a book in the baby bag. I know Sisters Who Breastfeed does books and babies. 
things like that. And I see that you're exclusively pumping. Sisters Who Breastfeed has, I've heard that they have numerous moms who are exclusively pumping and our moms are, you know, mostly breastfeeding or chest feeding. Maybe you want to check them out and then come bring back some information to us. So it's a good way to steer them, but to also leave that door open to come back because, you know, having multiple access, having access to multiple breastfeeding groups is only a plus. Right, and, I, and I'll share, you know, an example from my research and um, why some moms choose to not come to certain groups is because they don't feel welcome there. Um, and so I think if you're the facilitator, it's gonna be within your hands to change the dynamic of your group so that people do feel welcome. Um, what are the images that you're using on your flyers to promote your group? Because if you're only promoting white women, um, that's not gonna appeal to black women. They're not gonna come to a group that looks like that. Um, are you making sure that you are applying and giving the same support to everyone in the group? Um, so I'll give an example um, that there was a black mom who attended a hospital-based um, breastfeeding support group. And there was a white mom who was sharing a story about, you know, regular breastfeeding problems that she had sore nipples and she didn't feel like her supply was coming in. And, you know, the group rallied around her and gave her tons of support, um, gave her handouts and resources and things to help her. And so when this woman then delivered, a Black woman delivered and came back to this group and basically expressed the exact same story, she didn't get any support. No one rallied around her. No one gave her any information. She was kind of just told that was normal breastfeeding stuff and it will go away. So I think we need to be mindful of making sure that we are being equitable in our conversations, that we're giving everyone identical support um, because it, it doesn't come across that way all the time. Okay, thank you. Um, another one came in. How can we encourage new moms to breastfeed past the pain when you're first starting to breastfeed? I think that's gonna come with constant and frequent support. Um, I know that um, Health Connect One has a model which we've, we've tried to mirror of touch points, um, getting in touch with families. We know as, you know, if we're in the world of lactation, we know when those hard points come. Um, so right after discharge, um, when milk starts to come in uh, at the two week mark. So making sure that there is um, a hand in um, addressing that mom frequently so that she's getting the support she needs to get through those barriers. Um, but sometimes it really is that one-on-one -on -one personalized approach and helping them to keep going. Um, really, it's a, it's a disadvantage that we're all virtual now because some things do require hands-on support. Um, but as much as we can, we try to do virtual Zooms, uh, well, not Zooms, but we use um, a HIPAA compliant platform to contact our moms to go over these things with them so that they feel supported. So I think it's really a matter of showing them the other side. And I think that's why the support group is so important because they get to see the mom who has a brand new baby and the mom who is tandem nursing her two-year-old and her, you know, six-month-old baby, they get to see that there is a, another side to breastfeeding. Whereas when you're in the middle of it, you only see how difficult it is. And so that's why the group is so valuable. Great. Thank you. Um, another question is, I'm curious regarding the support you find that leads to the most success in meeting goals. How frequent are you in communication? Any successful videos? any information that you share, which leads to high success in supporting the mothers? I wouldn't say there's one specific thing um, that we do. I, we try not to um, give the, the families more contact than they want um, because then we become annoying. So we really do offer them, you know, the ability to contact us when they need to if we don't hear from them for a little while, we'll give them a nudge and check in and see what's going on. And sometimes that is what's needed um, because as life begins to get hard, they kind of fall off a little bit and get more immersed in what's happening in their immediate circle. And they're not reaching out because they're trying to deal with whatever they're dealing with in that moment. So whether that's um, a transition back to work um, or something that is related to just being a mother, um, they may not always look to us. So sometimes we do have to reach out to them and that has been helpful as we'll hear, you know, oh, the baby just got readmitted to the NICU and I was struggling with this. They don't some, sometimes take the initiative them on their own to reach out to us. So I think just having that availability constantly um, has been helpful. 
Great. Um, another one. Um, would you be able to make recommendations for prenatal breastfeeding education? In your research, have you received feedback for breastfeeding, uh, prenatal breastfeeding education that does work? I think that the breastfeeding education traditionally tends to focus on the benefits to breastfeeding and how amazing breastfeeding is. And when you question women about this, that tends to be the reason why they got there in the first place. They tend to really understand that what they don't get is the hands-on stuff to actually address breastfeeding problems. So when the baby's not latching right, what are you supposed to do? When the latch feels painful, how are you supposed to address that? Um, when your breasts are full at 2 a.m., what do you do about that? So it tends to be more the typical struggles that um, breastfeeding people have um, during their breastfeeding journeys that they don't feel they make the connection between the application of it. They kind of hear the information, but when it's in happening in the moment, the application of how to address it tends to be a little bit lost. So I would say work on strategies that really help you to help families to apply that information to their particular scenario, whether that's sharing case studies, um, whether that is having other people share stories about how they've managed certain things. Um, it tends to be more of a, a disconnect between the information and being able to apply the information to their scenario. Melly, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. I, I do, I do. I think that you you made some great points. I also wanted to point out, um, I've noticed in our groups, um, there's also a lot of, I guess, amazement and people, our group members start to have these different ideas about formula once we discuss the risks of a formula feeding. Um, just because, and Dr. Davis has said this before, you know, just because, you know, our neighbor's kids and um, our family member's kids have turned out okay being 100% formula fed, you know, those may have been some of the luckier you know, incidents. So we really need to address the risk of formula feeding with our families um, because it's been so normalized and shifted to breastfeeding being the the choice of, you know, the healthiest infant feeding choice. A lot of our group members don't, they can't relate to that term. You know, breastfeeding is the healthiest feeding choice for your baby, that they actually have a choice. So that's my my addition to that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add that the, you know, the hospital introducing the formula tends to set that narrative that this is okay. Um, and so if we're having some breastfeeding issues, we have to do put in different measures to address them so that formula doesn't become what we're leaning on to fix the breastfeeding issues. Because once they leave, that becomes more and more bottles are given breastfeeding tends to be decreased, it goes out the window, and then that's done. So we also need to, what part of our work is that advocacy component and the ability to say no to certain things. When things are offered in the hospital, it becomes almost like you must do instead of this is your choice and option to. So instead of formula, maybe we could use um, a glucose tab. There's, you know, different ways that we can address um, hypoglycemia that don't include using formula many of our families weren't offered those options. So I think just having that conversation and, and being able to advocate for themselves that no, there are alternatives to this. There are different ways to do this um, so that they can use their voice because often in the hospital, they, they don't have that opportunity. Great, thank you. We just have a, a couple more. One is, could Melanie please say more about how she partners with centering groups? Does she visit, visit each pregnancy group at least once as a standard practice while moms are enrolled? For example, the fourth visit each time. So we are, since centering has resumed um, during COVID-19, um, we I've been able to go into the actual groups and work with the midwives and the nurses who are in uh, those specific components. So I've met about, um, maybe five cohorts so far, and I usually come in around the 24th week of pregnancy, um, and the midwives introduce me as a certified lactation counselor to offer a little bit of information. And what I do is I offer general breastfeeding um, support to all the moms who are who are interested but um by collecting their information 
for the ones who are interested. Um, I also reach out on an individual um, and personal, either by phone call or email, and let them let the women who identify as Black or anywhere on the Afro diaspora that there is a group that they may be interested in. So um, when I go into centering, which I think is an awesome, awesome um, program, and I'm so glad that it's here in New Jersey. Um, when I go in, I'm offering general information, but when I'm able to speak with the women individually, um, I do let them know that there is a group, why we have sisters who breastfeed and how important it is for them to have this information for themselves or for their members of their family or the community. Thank you. And we're just about out of time, but I'll just squeeze one more in. Um, thank you for discussing the need for more Black breastfeeding counselors and IBCLCs and need for greater opportunities for clinical lactation internships and in hospitals for Black and non-nurse candidates. And do you have any tips on how those of us outside of hospitals can work to increase those opportunities? Well, I'll say for those who are on the pathway three, finding a mentor has been the biggest challenge. So if you have it within your capabilities to offer mentorship um, to candidates, that would be incredible. Um, that has become um, not just in New Jersey, but in general um, for um, black IB, future black IBCLCs, the barrier has been finding um, a mentor to give them hours. So if you have the ability to take someone on um, I know right now um, IBCLE is still approving virtual hours, so if you can offer that um, or in-person support, that would be incredibly helpful. Mel, you're on the pathway, so you, I'm sure, have some things I you am. want to share. <laughs> um, it's a very difficult path, and I just want to share um, on a personal note, um, when I first thought about it, it was a lot easier in 2012 because you just needed you know, a few basic hours and experience, but things have changed. And um, now I'm, I'm starting and Dr. Davis and the partnership are helping me to get to that path, but it's a lot of work and I believe it's work, worth it because like you said, there's a handful of um, people of color that hold that title. And I think it does make a difference um, just to, uh, repeat what was you know, told to me by a member of our group, which is it really helps to have someone who looks like me understand what's going on. And I, I, like Dr. Davis said in the, in the top of, you know, when we started, you know, sometimes what we say needs to be uncomfortable, but it's not a bad thing that people want to identify and want to relate with the person that they're opening up and sharing some really, really deep and personal, you know, thoughts and experiences on. So it's okay to allow a mom the request that maybe she she needs that support from someone who looks like her. And it's okay to step back. It's not that you didn't do your job. It's not that you did anything wrong necessarily. Right. It's just sometimes that's the that's the deliverable that will get the job done. And I think it's just being a black woman and needing to navigate different worlds and having to um, code switch essentially, which means you have to be one way in one space and a different way in a different space. And sometimes that's exhausting to have to be different people in different rooms. And sometimes you just wanna show up as you and our spaces allow us to do that. Um, working with someone who gets that allows you to have that freedom to just be your authentic self. Um, and that is really, really important component of, of, of anything. Well, thank you so much to both of you. Um, we are out of time today, but I want to thank you for, for start having this important conversation here. Um, and so, so thanks for uh, Dr. Nastasha Davis, Melanie Hutton, and Karim Amadeo, who's handling the technical back end of the program, and to all of you who have joined us today. So just a reminder, in about an hour, you will receive an email with a link to post-program evaluation, and your feedback is important, so please take the time to complete. And certificates of completion will be sent via email on the, e on the email that you provide on the evaluation, so please try to make sure that that is correct. And a calendar of the partnership's upcoming virtual programs can be found at www partnershipmch.org under the professional education tab. We also offer online on-demand recordings of many of our programs which are listed there as well. So we hope you can join us for our next educational event.